Thank you, members. The next items of business are motions to approve five statutory rules, all of which relate to the health protection coronavirus regulations. There will be a single debate on all five motions. I will ask the clerk to read the first motion, then call upon the minister to move it. The minister will then commence the debate on all of the motions listed on the order paper. When all who wish to speak have done so, I shall put the question on the first motion. The second motion will then be read into the record, and I will call upon the minister to move it. The question will then be put on that motion. This process will be repeated for each of the remaining statutory rules. If that is clear, then we shall proceed on that basis. And I ask the clerk to read the first motion, please. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 13, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. Thank you. I call the Minister of Justice, Mrs Naomi Long, to move the motion. I beg to move. Thank you, Minister. The Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate, and I call upon the Minister of Justice to open the debate on the motions. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. This morning I am asking the Assembly to confirm five sets of regulations now made. These Department of Health regulations introduce amendments to the Public Health Protection Regulations, which are made and amended as necessary to give effect to the Executive's decisions. I have, however, agreed to lead the debate this morning in the Chamber for two reasons. Firstly, whilst all of the regulations are prepared by the Department of Health, in the case of the first two sets of amendments concerned with the increase of fines and penalties, my department worked in collaboration with Department of Health officials. Colleagues will recall the Executive's agreement to the proposals that I brought forward in October to increase fines and penalties and to introduce a number of new offences on foot of the rapid review of fines and penalties requested by the Strategic Compliance Group. That group was set up earlier this year by the Executive to oversee arrangements for encouraging compliance with public health restrictions. It was a natural step, therefore, given my Department's role for me to lead this debate. Secondly, as my officials were preparing for the debate, three more sets of amendments to give effect to the Executive's decisions with regard to public health restrictions were made. I therefore further agreed to lead the debate on these sets of amendments in the interest of supporting the Health Minister and the Executive Office in a collaborative way. Turning now to the regulations, the first of these, the Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 13 regulations, deals with a number of changes to the main public health regulations, commonly referred to as the No. 2 regulations, in respect of the offences and penalties that apply when the restrictions are breached. The second set of regulations, the Fourth Amendment to the regulations dealing with the wearing of face coverings, increases the level of fixed penalties for failure to wear face coverings in settings prescribed by the coronavirus regulations. Both sets of regulations came into effect at 5.30 p.m. on the 12th of November. The third set of regulations, the Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 14, provide district councils with the powers to enforce the No. 2 regulations, including the issue of premises improvement notices. These regulations came into effect at 4 p.m. on the 13th of November. The fourth set of regulations, the Coronavirus Restriction Amendment No. 15 regulations, deal with the extension of the restrictions initially introduced on the 16th of October and the limited relaxation of these restrictions in respect of coffee shops, close contact services and off sales. The regulations came into effect at 6.30 p.m. on the 13th of November. The fifth and final set of regulations, the Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 16, ensured that unlicensed premises which reopened on the 20th of November were restricted to no more than six people per table from no more than two households. These regulations came into effect at 8 p.m. on the 19th of November. I will now set out in detail the content of each of the set of regulations in turn. SR 2020, number 250, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions, number 2, Amendment number 13, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, were signed at 5.30 p.m. on the 12th of November and laid before the Assembly at 9.30 a.m. on the 13th of November. Amendment number 13 increases the previous fines and penalties and introduces new offences as follows. The fixed penalty, which previously started at £60, has been replaced by a single fixed penalty of £200 
or, if paid within a period of 14 days of issue, £100. This penalty applies to breaches of restrictions relating to gatherings in public or private places, which remain punishable on conviction by a fine of up to £5,000. The regulations also provide that the recipient of a £200 fixed penalty cannot be issued with another one in respect of the same offence. The option of summary prosecution may be used instead. The offences of not closing a business as required or breaching the early closing requirements for hospitality will be punishable on conviction by a fine of up to £10,000 or attract a fixed penalty starting at £1,000, which can be increased for subsequent breaches up to a maximum of £10,000. A new offence of not implementing measures to maintain social distancing in retail and hospitality settings will be punishable on conviction by a fine of up to £10,000 or a fixed penalty starting at £1,000, which can be increased for subsequent breaches up to a maximum of £10,000. And a new offence of organising or participating in a large gathering or unlicensed music event, with large defined as 30 persons or more, will carry the new higher level penalty for organisers, that is, punishable on conviction by a fine of up to £10,000 or a fixed penalty starting at £1,000 and increasing up to a maximum of £10,000 for further breaches, and the new lower penalty for participants, punishable on conviction by a fine of up to £5,000 or a fixed penalty of £200. The fixed penalty of £200 will reduce to £100 if paid within 14 days of issue. Next are SR 2020 number 253, the Health Protection Coronavirus, Wearing of Face Coverings Amendment No. 4, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and were signed at 5.30pm on the 12th of November and led before the Assembly at 9am on the 13th of November, and increase the penalties for failing to comply with the Health Protection Regulations in respect of the Wearing of Face Coverings as follows. The fixed penalty, which previously started at £60, has been replaced by a fixed penalty of £200, or, if paid within 14 days, will be reduced to £100. This penalty, which remains punishable on conviction by a fine of up to £5,000, applies to breaches of restrictions relating to the wearing of face coverings in settings prescribed by the regulations. As before, the regulations also provide that the recipient of a £200 fixed penalty fixed penalty cannot be issued with another one in respect of the same offence. Moving on then to SR 2020, number 255, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions, number 2, Amendment number 14, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. Those were signed at 4pm on the 13th of November 2020 and laid in the Assembly at 5pm on the 13th of November 2020. These regulations provide district councils with the power to designate persons to enforce the number two regulations and to issue a premises improvement notice where those responsible for premises are in breach of the number two regulations and to specify a time limit within which the measures required must be taken, which must not be less than 48 hours from the time the, issue is no the, is the issuing of the notice. SR 2020, number 256, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions, number 2, Amendment number 15, Regulations, Northern Ireland, 2020, were signed by the Department of Health at 6.30pm on the 13th of November and laid before the Assembly at 9am on the 16th of November. These regulations deal with the extension of the restrictions initially introduced on the 16th of October and the limited relaxation of these restrictions in respect of coffee shops, close contact services and off-sales. These regulations allowed the reopening under certain conditions of unlicensed food and drink businesses, cafes and coffee shops mostly. They were allowed to reopen from the 20th of November with opening hours limited from 5am to 8pm. The reopening from the 20th of November of close contact services sector, including hairdressing, tattoo parlours and holistic therapies and driving instruction. As a condition of that reopening, these businesses were required to operate only by appointment and were required to collect and retain for a period of time the names and contact telephone numbers of customers for contact tracing purposes. And finally, the regulations removed a restriction that had previously been placed on pubs and bars that prevented them from selling alcohol for consumption off the premises. Although many bars and pubs have an off licence, the regulations had sought to prevent them selling alcohol for consumption off the premises during this time. The lifting of this restriction was accompanied by the requirement that they only sold drink in the original sealed container 
so that bars were not selling glasses of alcohol to customers on the street. Then SR 2020, number 276, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions, number 2, Amendment, number 16, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, were signed at 8 p.m. on the 19th of November and laid in the Assembly at 9 a.m. on the 20th of November 2020. These regulations ensure that the unlicensed premises which reopened on the 20th of November were governed by a rule to restrict numbers of customers to no more than six per table from no more than two households. These five sets of amendments are designed to encourage adherence to the restrictions and to deter any breach of them. They complement the basic but critically important and consistent public health messaging of wash your hands, keep your distance, wear a face covering. I beg to move. Thank you, Minister. I call the Chair of the Justice Committee, Mr Paul Given. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I'm uh, pleased to be able to speak on behalf of the Committee for Justice in uh, this debate today. The Committee for Justice first received notification of the health protection regulations before the House today in a written briefing from the Department of Justice that was received on the 1st of December. Yes, that's seven days ago. One week ago was when the Committee provided a written briefing. The committee was advised that two of the regulations are of relevance to the Department of Justice as they relate to offences, fines and penalties for breaches of the regulations. Therefore, although the responsibility for the regulations rest with the Health Minister, the Minister of Justice agreed to lead the debate on those two regulations along with the three others in support of the Health Minister as the Justice Minister has outlined. In the course of this pandemic, the Justice Committee has received both written and oral briefings and updates on COVID-19 and the impact on the justice sector on a fairly regular basis. We have questioned officials and senior police officers, including the Chief Constable, on breaches of the regulations and the approach to enforcement. We have sought information on the number of fines and fixed penalty notices issued and also on the number and type of breaches that have been reported via the COVID-19 hotline. Despite this, there was no engagement by the Department with the Committee on the review of fines and penalties that gave rise to the challenges reflected in these regulations. The review of offences and penalties was carried out collaboratively by the Department of Justice and the Department of Health, and it was the Minister of Justice who recommended the proposed changes to the Executive. The Department of Justice advised uh, the Committee that those proposals were considered by the Executive on the 8th and the 15th of October. There was therefore, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, ample time to inform the Committee for Justice of these proposed changes well before the notification of the 1st of December. It has been said... Ms Bradshaw, point of order. Okay, um, um, Principal Deputy Speaker, would you remind the House that Section uh, of Standing Order 43.1 provides that the statutory rules laid before the Assembly and subject to Assembly proceedings, including negative, affirmative, confirmatory procedure, shall stand referred to the appropriate committee for scrutiny. And in this instance, because they are Department of Health um, regulations, that it is right and proper that we as a committee were the ones that scrutinised it. Thank you. Uh, the member's understanding of Standing Order 43.1 is correct. Mr Gibbon. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. It has been said many times before that this situation is unprecedented and it is sometimes necessary to make changes at a swift pace. However, that does not appear to have been the case in this specific instance. The Committee discussed the Department of Justice's written briefing on these regulations at the meeting on 3 December. The Committee recognises that the scrutiny of the health protection statutory rules is a matter for the Committee for Health and that the Committee is often required to consider regulations at short notice, which does not always allow for consultation with other committees. The committee is concerned, however, that there may be a more widespread scrutiny deficit, with statutory committees being either unaware or provided with last-minute notification of policy changes relevant to their department's remit that are being included in health protection regulations. I will therefore be writing to the First and Deputy First Ministers on behalf of the Committee to ask all the departments to engage with their respective statutory committee on matters to be included in the health protection regulations that fall within their remit at the earliest opportunity. 
I am unable to provide the Committee's position on the regulations, given that we have not had the opportunity to consider them or the policy intention behind them. I understand that the Department of Justice officials gave oral evidence to the Committee for Health, and therefore it will be for the Chair of the Health Committee and members of the Health Committee to comment on the specific aspects in respect of the detail contained within the regulations. Mr. Speaker, those remarks are made in my capacity as Chairman of the Justice Committee. I appreciate some members seem to struggle to recognise the role of a Chairman of a Committee, but that position is the unanimous position held of all of the parties within the Justice Committee in terms of what I have just articulated. Setting aside my role as Chairman of the Committee, speaking as a personal capacity in respect of these regulations and the process by which they have been brought about. The Justice Committee um, recognises, as I outlined in my role as Chairman of the Committee, the unprecedented way in which these regulations have been taken forward. It recognises, and I recognise, that it is the legislative framework through the uh, Department of Health and indeed then the Statutory Committee for Health to deal with the detail around the statutory rules. And indeed, I received a letter from the First and Deputy First Minister yesterday um, outlining this issue, and I want to thank and put on the record uh, my appreciation to Arlene Foster and Michelle O'Neill uh, for writing uh, to me in my capacity as Chairman of the Justice Committee. Uh, and the First and Deputy First Minister outlined the approach that the Executive have been taking, the collaborative way in which they are seeking to operate, and I agree with all of that. Uh, that is not, however, uh, uh, withstanding the issue around the roles of committees. And, uh, in my conversation that I had with the First Minister yesterday, I was able to provide that assurance to the First Minister that the Justice Committee takes its role very important, uh, as do uh, I in, in terms of my membership of that committee. And where committees have an opportunity to engage and to be consulted upon, that is something that I would advocate that all ministers uh, should be doing with their relevant committee. Um, because under the relevant per, uh, powers conferred upon committees uh, within Section 29 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, and indeed Standing Orders of this House, Standing Order No. 48, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, it outlines the powers of committees. And within the powers of committees, uh, the final bullet point says that for the Justice Committee, it is to consider and advise on matters brought to the committee by the Minister for Justice. We were denied that opportunity because the Minister for Justice did not come to the Justice Committee. Departmental officials did not come to the Justice Committee. We recognise the legal statutory process for how this is being engaged, but whenever it came, whenever it came to what the Minister could have done, she could have led the way on this and engaged with the Justice Committee. She chose not to do so. That's, that's a decision for the Justice Minister. I'll take an intervention, yes. What happens in the Alliance Party is that if an issue comes before us as a Health Committee that uh, crosses into other departments, I engage with my MLA colleagues in those departments or those committees to find out their position on it. I engage with them before I go so that I am there representing the whole party at the Health Committee. Are you suggesting that that is not what has happened in your side of the House? Well, of course my members will engage across political parties, but that is not to negate the opportunity that all members of this House have through our membership of the, the, the relevant committees to provide an opportunity. As I indicated, the committee has engaged with the Chief Constable. We have engaged with ACC Todd in terms of gold command when it comes to enforcement, and these are all relevant to the regulations when it comes to enforcement. So, of course, I understand the way in, in which things operate, but there are opportunities, and members can bring that expertise through their normal committee membership. And what, what uh, I think will be important to address, because in the letter um, that I received, which was circulated to all Justice Committee members, uh, the Executive Office um, uh, indicates that we understand that some members of the Justice Committee consider that in light of the Minister of Justice's offer to lead on tomorrow's debate, the scrutiny rule should therefore have been conferred on it, and they intend to express their dissatis dissatisfaction during the debate. Now, I was able to um, provide useful information to the First Minister to explain what the Justice Committee had actually agreed to do. So I think there is an issue about what was the information source when it came to advising the Executive Office. Who provided the information on what the, the Justice Committee had agreed, what we had discussed, 
because it certainly has informed the basis of a letter that I would question, and I think uh, there needs to be an explanation in respect of that, and no doubt the Minister will uh, elaborate on it. But I will happily give way, despite the fact that the Minister never engaged with the Committee. I will, however, engage with the Minister on the floor of the Assembly. Is, is, the, is the Committee Chair aware that the sessions of Committee are public and that people can watch them on television? Well, that will be an interesting uh, explanation if that is the basis upon which uh, I received then this letter. Because if anyone watched the proceedings of the committee, they would know what the committee uh, decided, just for members' benefit, because the minutes of that committee meeting has now been published. So members will now know what the committee agreed. The committee agreed unanimously of all parties. At the meeting on the 3rd of September, the committee has agreed to write to FMDFM, asking that all ministers engage with their respective statutory committees on relevant aspects of COVID-19 health regulations that cover policy areas that are the responsibility of their departments. That correspondence is going to be copied to all chairmen, madam chairs, of the different committees. The committee also agreed to ask uh, the Department of Justice why there was no engagement with it or information provided on the review of offences or penalties and the proposed changes prior to the 1st of December, given that this falls within the remit of the Department of Justice. The committee also agreed to ask for the protocol advising the committee when DOJ officials are providing oral evidence to another statutory committee. At no stage did the Justice Committee seek to usurp the legal responsibility of the Health Committee in carrying out its role when it came to the statutory rule. However, there is nothing stopping, and indeed I would encourage the Justice Minister, as she seeks to uh, work with the Justice Committee. We have an important role. We can provide you with advice and support, and we can give an insight. But, Minister, we can only do that when you decide to engage with the Justice Committee. And I hope uh, that in future you seek to take a more constructive approach when it comes to these COVID-19 regulations. I'm sorry to interrupt the member, but could I remind him that comments should be directed through the chair? Of course, Principal Deputy Speaker. So turning to the uh, specific regulations that relate to enforcement, uh, and this is an issue that we have had to consider in the Justice Committee, uh, and we have had the police in before us, because whenever you introduce, Principal Deputy Speaker, enforcement measures, uh, the fines that are being introduced or that have already taken effect, uh, what is vitally important is that we see a consistency of approach then in their application. We know from the uh, early months uh, that it took the police a period of time to quality assure, if I can put it in that way, the, the way in which they were dealing with uh, checking uh, uh, people's activities. And we had those cases where the police were looking into people's shopping bags and wanting to know was that an essential item that was being bought. And we know the furore that that created. So the police had to uh, put uh, measures in place. Uh, to ensure that there was a consistency of approach being applied, and I welcome uh, the way in which the police put uh, those measures in place. Of course, we, we would have, had we been given an opportunity, we would have considered um, uh, the proportionality of the fines being associated with it. Obviously, the Justice Committee, we would look at issues around fines for speeding offences, for example. We all know that speeding kills, and we would have been able to look at uh, you know, what is the current fine when it comes to speeding and compared it to this fine that has been introduced. Uh, however, we, we weren't able to do that because we weren't engaged. And then we need to consider um, how different breaches have been handled by the police service. Uh, I know members have raised the issue of policing protests, the Black Lives Matter protests that took place where fines uh, were issued. Uh, indeed, in the most recent regulations that have been introduced, we, we now have cases uh, where uh, Church authorities have been interviewed by the police because of uh, alleged breaches of those regulations. Uh, and then, of course, people compare and contrast that to uh, the lack of police interviews when it comes to a particular funeral in West Belfast. And then we raise the issue about the public having confidence in the administration of these fines that are being put in place. So I would say, Principal Deputy Speaker, that in having enforcement measures, we then need to see them being equally applied to everybody in society. There cannot be a two-tier approach to policing. And uh, the Minister for Justice has a particular role in ensuring public confidence in the administration of justice. And I know she will say these are operational matters 
for the PSNI, and, and uh, that is a, a, a position that she has taken uh, from assuming office. Uh, but whenever that operational decision-making process then impinges upon public confidence, I do think then that engages the scope of the Justice Minister. I'll give way to Mr Wells. I will give way that there is deep concern within the community that the police, we understand, have indicated that they are going to be swift to take action against Tandragi Baptist Church for its alleged breach of the coronavirus restrictions, whilst we understand that the police have yet to interview the leader of the party opposite in Northern Ireland, Michelle O'Neill, about what occurred and the disgraceful scenes we witnessed at the Bobby Story funeral. Well, the, the member makes the point very well, and, and that is, whenever I look at these regulations that are going through uh, the House today, we are increasing the level of fines. Uh, and we are making it clear as an assembly that an enforcement is an important tool. It is the application then of that tool that requires consistency of approach by the police service of Northern Ireland. So I share the concerns that the member uh, has elaborated upon. And so, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, it is important uh, that uh, effective enforcement measures are in place. But, Principal Deputy Speaker, we all have the power in our own hands to act in a way which is responsible to apply common sense that we should not need enforcement within our community when it comes to uh, policing these regulations. The best form of policing any society is self-policing, it is self-regulation, it is that awareness of one's own personal responsibility, and that is ultimately where we need to get to. However, there will always be a minority that flagrantly breach the law. And that then undermines the entire message, and that requires effective enforcement and policing uh, to take place. In the absence of that, it then leads to people no longer acting in a way which I believe is necessary to be responsible. And what is the further consequence of that? The executive having to take action to close down businesses, those small businesses, close contact services, the hairdressers, the salons. And they have paid the price because there has not been self-regulation and then there has not been the kind of enforcement that there should have been. And so let there be a better approach so that we do not need to take actions against those other individuals in our society and organisations. I will give way. Yes. I appreciate the strength in which the member delivers the importance of ensuring we adhere to the regulations. Has the member given such advice to his colleague, Sammy Wilson? Of course, all members need to behave in a sensible and responsible manner. That is for everybody in this House uh, to conduct themselves in that way, uh, in whatever parliament that you are in. Uh, but let's not get distracted um, by the core substance of what it is that we are dealing with today. Uh, it is important. Uh, that we have a consistency of approach when it comes to the policing of this. And I look forward to hearing the Minister's response and providing uh, a justification uh, of her failure to engage with members of the Justice Committee. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call the Chair of the Health Com Committee, Mr Colin Gildernew. Um, I appreciate the Minister being here today to uh, address the Assembly in relation to these measures. Um, the Health Committee considered the first four sets of regulations on the 26th of November, but Amendment 16 was included on the final order paper without prior notice to the Committee and therefore added late to our agenda on Thursday. Briefing on the first, SRs, the first four SRs was provided by a cross-departmental group of officials who gave an overview of the main provisions, including the extension of the Schedule II restrictions, subject to modifications, additional requirements in relation to premises selling food or drink, new premises improvement notices, and changes to penalties, including for failure to wear a face covering. Officials also advised us of a strategic level working group established by the Executive to look at compliance with coronavirus regulations. We were advised this is chaired by junior ministers and that it brings together a range of agencies and has conducted a rapid review since September due to concerns about rates of transmission and a desire to ensure effective deterrence from breaching the rules. Provisions relating to increased penalties prompted questions around rationale, necessity, the evidence base and equality considerations. The remaining questions centred on practical outworkings. 
Given the absence of a formal equality impact assessment of the higher penalties, members probed the consideration given to this matter, such as affordability issues relating to masks and the differential impact increased fines could have. While assuring the committee that such matters were taken into account and agreeing that there could be potential inequalities, officials could not provide detail and advised they might not be able to come back to us as the executive papers are confidential. Yes. Thank the member for taking an intervention. Would the member agree with me that it is important that the PSNA continue their course of action around engagement, encouragement and enforcement, the three E's as they had talked about at the start, to address exactly the issues that you have just raised, to, to establish in some circumstances people will just not understand the regulations. We have to accept that because they are very complex, even for those of us who are going through them every day. So for the ordinary people out there in the street, it is difficult and I think the PSNA need to continue in that vein so that people fully understand the implications of what they are doing. Yes, and I thank the member for her intervention. Yes, I would agree. I think it is absolutely essential that this starts out from a point of view of, first of all, communication, but then certainly in terms of engagement and encouragement. And I think in some ways, when we come to enforcement, actually, it, it, it kind of demonstrates a failure of all those other steps and that we need to very much work from that basis and to very much understand that there are people who potentially will struggle to uh, abide by the restrictions due to lack of lack of uh, income, and they, they are they are difficult in some in some senses. So officials uh, officials also outlined the continued approach to using enforcement as a last resort in keeping with the member's intervention, but couldn't provide detail on trends or fines related to that. We wanted to know about the evidence base underpinning the increase in fines in terms of anticipated improvements in compliance. An official said that they will come back to us on this. We asked about affordability issues in relation to masks, and we were advised that officials would take this back. Yes, I'll give way. I appreciate the member giving way, uh, and he, he is firmly on the record, as am I, in the inappropriate way in which these regulations come before the House and the lack of scrutiny thereof. The very points that the member has just outlined surely goes to the very heart of the lack of democratic scrutiny within this House, the very fact that we are here today debating these regulations when officials come before the committee and cannot provide the information, promise to come back and still haven't provided. Does he not agree with me that the very fact that the Justice Committee have outlined today that they had no role in the scrutiny of these regulations is some concern given the lack of democratic scrutiny that has come before this House? I thank the member for his intervention. I have been consistent that we need to see good information and good engagement coming across whatever committees are, are relevant to the scrutiny of these. I think the pertinent thing is that while we recognise that these are unusual situations, unusual circumstances, and I will later deal with the, the fact that we would not in normal circumstances be, be considering legislation in this way or changes to rules in this way. However, I think it is incumbent on all the departments and uh, everyone concerned to provide that level of data and analysis. Um, so, and, and if, if committees, as the member has indicated, are being asked to support regulations, it should be provided with a clear sense of why that legislation is needed and why this particular approach is best versus another approach, and, and that we would be able to assess that. I'm quite sure these questions are asked. Yes, I will. In the same vein, uh, the members' committee has um, considered a successive number of these regulations. Each one of them, on the face of the regulations, bears the affirmation that there was no impact assessment, sometimes no regulatory impact assessment, or simply no uh, impact assessment. Has that never given the committee any concern that you're asked to consider regulations where there's been no impact assessment? Thank the member for his intervention. Yes, that is one of the issues of concern and one of the issues that the committee are increasingly seeking to ensure that whatever vehicle is used, that there is a maximum consideration given. But these, these, uh, as we move further into what should be normal ways of, of operating, they, I believe that there should be equality impact or there should be some attempt made to address the lack of equality impact. So. Um, 
On a, on, a, on a practical note, the detail of information to be gathered by hospitality settings was raised. A member suggested that the requesting an address might support businesses wishing to comply with the rule restricting numbers of persons at a table to no more than six and from no more than two households. And, um, so responding to a question on the distinction, and, and I recognise that is difficult. Actually, I've, I've spoke this morning with uh, somebody who's involved in the hospitality business who reports that that is a very difficult thing to establish. Responding to a question on the distinction between retail and office settings, officials explained that health and safety legislation deals with workers, whereas the present suite of regulations is aimed at protecting the public. The committee is, as ever, seeking to be constructive, but also to provide the appropriate scrutiny on behalf of the public. And, last can call you, one source of data that does inform the committee on a regular basis, along with all of the other pieces of information, is, unfortunately, the new daily case rate, the hospital admissions, the ICU capacity, which is today sitting at 99%, and sadly, the daily reported deaths, which as of today are 1,059, and none of that evidence and information can be ignored either. Despite reservations arising from some unanswered questions, the committee agreed to lend its support. The committee recognises that the regulations are cross-departmental in origin, and the committee has written to the Health Department as the drafting lead, seeking to have its concerns heard and addressed in future sets of regulations. Indeed, something the Justice Minister could directly comment on in her response is whether the, Minister, whether the Department has, consult, has been consulted on a, directly at this time in developing a new COVID-19 strategy or even if the Executive has seen a new detailed strategy that includes pillars of finding, testing, tracing, isolating and supporting the public. This was a Health Committee motion agreed by consensus in the Committee and again agreed by consensus here in this House. Uh, we have called for a new COVID strategy developed by the Department of Health and supported by the wider executive to end a cycle of lockdowns. That was passed last, here last month in this chamber and as we enter the early phases of Christmas and the vaccination programme, it would be timely to hear in progress to date on any development of that new robust strategy. So with your permission, Prior Lasky and Corley, I'd now like to address members briefly in my role as MLA and Sinn Féin Spokesperson for Health. I'm sure many members will make similar points as the debate goes on, but I am concerned about the steady number of new cases announced daily. To put it bluntly, we're not seeing the drop in case numbers in admissions and sadly in deaths that we had hoped for. I cannot help but think of the, the absolute mess when public health proposals were voted against in the executive using a cross-community vote and where we could be now or maybe now if the executive had been able to act quicker. However, we are where we are. I will. Uh, I know what the member has said in relation to where we are today, but had the member the same concerns when most of his colleagues on the benches around him actually attended a funeral in breach of the same regulations? Gormay Huggett. And that matter has been addressed multiple times in this assembly. However, we are where we are, and one constant feature during the COVID-19 pandemic has been the ever-present lack of time. So I think it is to be expected that some of the technical amendments that tidy up the original intentions of the decisions are brought forward. It has to be said again, no one, none of us want the restrictions to be in place for any longer than they have to be. However, unfortunately, the case for restrictions are being made often better in the corridors of the ICU wards on the countless calendars of missed crucial appointments for other health matters, and on the need for family to, to uh, resort to FaceTime calls, visiting family members as a result of home visiting restrictions. Prior Laskin and Corlea, I support these amendments, and let's continue to do all we can individually and collectively to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Thank you. I call the Chair of the Executive Office Committee, Mr. Colin McGrath. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, um, and I'll be making my remarks as a, an SDLP member. Um, I want to thank you uh, for getting the opportunity to be able to speak in this debate today, and I thank the Justice Minister for coming to the House today and actually bringing some legislation forward and participating in the debate. Mr. Speaker, the regulations which we are being asked to debate and ratify today do take us back somewhat to about the middle of November. 
um, and that is a time uh, which on reflection many in this House would choose to forget, uh, given the chaos that was allowed to take hold at that stage. But today is a momentous day in terms of the fight against COVID-19, and we must keep our eyes fixed firmly on the future and how we will do things from here. And I think it's important that we note uh, that the first COVID vaccine has been given uh, to Margaret Keenan over in England, although hailing from Maniskillen, and the first uh, vaccine has been given here uh, in the north to a constituent from South Down, uh, to Joanna Sloan, who is a nurse, uh, and we welcome that she has received that and wish her and everybody else that receives that vaccine the very best as they move forward to deliver the vaccine uh, to people right across Northern Ireland. Uh, to the amendments themselves, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, amendments number 13 provide additional requirements in relation to food and drink establishments further provision for social distancing and large gatherings and increase the fines that a breach of these carried. Amendment number four for the face coverings also increased the level of fines on those who breached the regulations. Amendment number 14 gives district councils the power to attach premise improvement notices to business, businesses who needed to amend their protection in light of the regulations. And then Amendment 15 concerned the circuit breaker that allowed the phased reopening for close contact services and the gradual reopening of hospitality. Finally, Amendment number 16 concerns those in close contact services working in film and television production and the number of households at a table in hospitality. I don't know about anybody else uh, in here, but getting the timeline of events uh, that happened back then and mapping them out can be quite confusing. There are so many different amendments that are being updated. Some of those amendments lapse by the time that we have the conversations here in the House. Some of the amendments have since changed, even though we're discussing them in the House. And I'm sure that everybody here in the House today can resonate with getting asked a question, uh, be it from a constituent or constituency office staff, that requires you to stop and think back in your head to work out exactly what the regulation is and what the impact of it is. But let's not be under any illusions. This role of scrutiny and legislation, uh, legislating is definitely not for the weak of heart. But what I do know, however, is that these regulations were and are necessary. Uh, we needed to do and need to continue to do all that we can to stop the spread of the virus and to help our beloved healthcare staff, who frankly have been the absolute heroes in this. We need this more now than ever as this vaccine is rolled out. But how do we actually do some of that? Well, we have to normalise some behaviours that previously would have seen, seemed improbable or potentially even impossible. For example, the wearing of face masks has become, for most of us, normalised. When someone in the public is not wearing a face mask and they are coughing or sneezing, you become very aware of the fact that they are not wearing a face mask. And how do you encourage the wearing of face masks? Well, you can do it through the science and you detail the reasons for actually doing it. You can do it through encouragement and asking people to, to carry out the activity of wearing a face mask. Or if necessary, from time to time, if people refuse, you have to levy fines. But that is what gets the conformity from around about April, May time through to now. So very quickly in wearing face masks, has been all of those together, but fines have played their part. Yes, of course. Would it not also be an encouragement for some people to wear masks if they were made freely available? I mean, these masks aren't inexpensive sometimes, especially the disposable ones, and if they were made freely available, you might see more people more likely to wear them. Go to my I thank the member for his intervention and know of his continued intervention in the Health Committee, especially highlighting in South East Asia where face masks are worn regularly and they have uh, been part of the ability to control uh, the spread of the virus there. And yes, I totally agree with him. I think they aren't very expensive. Um, I 
think from checking DUP returns are about 48 quid for quite a considerable box load of them for people. Um, and I think if you can actually get uh, the, the face masks and make them available for people, then it would encourage um, the, the use of them. And I know it is an extra cost for businesses, but I think sometimes people do find themselves at shops and other places and in a situation where they don't have a mask and they could do with one. So um, I think just having the general availability of them would certainly help. Sorry, going ahead. I yeah, appreciate the member giving way, and he's articulated a clear position around the need for wearing masks, and one that I wouldn't disagree with. Would he also comment for those who, under the law, rightly have an exemption for respiratory reasons, whether that's asthma or indeed psychological reasons? And it's important that we respect their position and that we don't have a scenario where people are being shamed because they have legitimate health reasons not to be wearing a face mask. Uh, I thank the member for his intervention and believe that those protections are in legislation and, and in the regulations as well, which actually specifically highlights that those that have particular reasons for not wearing uh, masks shouldn't have to wear them. So I, I welcome that those protections are there as well. Member Wish, yeah. I thank the member for taking a second intervention in such a short space of time. Just in, in light of what you have said around that provision and people finding themselves at shops, and, and I have seen that even for myself on many occasions, it, it is an issue. And, and if you've come by public transport, it's different if you ha only have to go back to your car. But if you've come by public transport, some shops do provide them. And I would encourage, I mean, these are the shops, these are re the retailers in most cases that have been able to stay open right through the pandemic and have done fairly well because they've been able to stay open. I think that they would be in a good position. We're talking about the big, big large retailers will be in a position to provide free masks. I, I get, thank the member for, for the intervention. And again, I think just holistically, we, we are making the point that if we can make masks available, it's of benefit and it is something that we should continue to do. Uh, and I would welcome that. In terms of the overall regulations that we're looking at um, today and, and questioning whether they were necessary, I think we have all accepted that the uh, regulations that we currently have were uh, and are necessary. And it does make you beg the question of asking, why did we stop for a week in the middle of the circuit breaker, reopen everything, and then close it back down again for a further two weeks. It does feel like that just didn't sit right. It means that we've kind of, we'll see a slight rise in cases, then we've shut down for two weeks and then things go back down again. Uh, and one has to reflect back to that period of time and say, would it have not have been better to have gone the six weeks right through? And I think it's already been mentioned that the numbers aren't dropping uh, as we would like to have seen them. And I hope that that may have been because, or that may have been because of that week where we didn't shut down. Yes, I give away for being so generous and giving way. Uh, will the member agree with me that intervention is absolutely essential to help support businesses through this very difficult time? However, the Eat Out to Help Out scheme may have been too generous and uh, far too early in that intervention, uh, given that it absolutely uh, has fed into the level of infection in our communities. Yeah, I mean, I think I thank the member for his intervention and think that, yes, we do need to provide as much support as we can to businesses because they are having a difficult time. But at the same time, we do need to make sure that the protections and support that we're providing for businesses maybe doesn't have an inadvertent consequence. But uh, I hope that we can provide the financial support uh, that businesses do actually need and that that way mean that they do not need uh, to operate to a level that may cause some difficulties. But, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, the vaccines are being rolled out to the most vulnerable and those at risk. Christmas is ahead of us. There is very real hope going forward into the new year, uh, but our work as legislators must continue. In conclusion, as we come to the end of the year once again and prepare to begin anew, let the lessons of the last few weeks not be lost on anyone in this House. Bullheadedness and digging your heels in gets us nowhere. It will only set us back. Let's approach the new year with a sense of optimism of what has been done, where we will have uh, let the public down, and a renewed sense of clarity, collective purpose, and cohesion for the executive. Therefore, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, while I have had issues with what's happened and in the way that it's happened in November, we continue uh, to be looking forward to the future, and we support the amendments as they're presented today. Thank you. Thank you. Members, given that it is now 12.51 and the Business Committee is due to meet at 1 o'clock, uh, I propose...
by leave of the Assembly to suspend this sitting until 2 p.m. First item of business when we return will be questions to the Economy Minister. When this item of business resumes, the next speaker will be Mr. Doug Beattie. Thank you, members. The sitting is suspended.